Okay, so God wants you well. He's a good dad. He wants you well. He wants you well. God wants you well. And I'm trusting to unlock faith here this morning that you can receive everything Jesus paid for you. He paid for your freedom, for your healing, for your provision, for everything. And so last weekend, it was, I would believe, I would say that the most powerful weekend of ministry I've ever experienced in South Africa. It was just, everything was just happening. Everything. I mean, we had so many people healed. Um, we'll share more of that in a bit. Um, we had mass deliverance. Just the power of God would just come upon people. Um, uh, pastor Niels, who's uh, the pastor there, he, he carries this gift of honor uh, upon his life. You know, and life flows through honor. And so it's, it's like a gift. It's like the ability to see what is on someone's life. And, and we as a team, we were so received. It was like we were treated like royalty, which we are in the spirit. But they honored not just us, but what we carried. And so God released incredible blessings over the church. The one um, in one of their life groups, their home groups, uh, the pastor said that the, the, the leader couldn't be there that last weekend, but they had life group in the week. And he said he had FOMO because for two hours, people were just sharing everything Jesus did over the weekend, how he set them free and how he healed them for like two hours, just in that small group. How many things God did in that group. And he was like, oh, I missed out. And I said, yes, you missed out. You missed out. You must be there when God is moving. You know, and the same with our conference coming up. You need to be there. I tell you, God is moving. God is moving. And it's, it is just incredible when He is moving and we can just partner with what He is doing. And so we believe the Lord has called us as a church to, to unlock revival in this city and for the wider body of Christ. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing pastors who suddenly their eyes are like, I didn't realize what you carry on your life, but I want that. Can I travel with you? Can I come and learn from you? And it's like the eyes are opening for what God is doing. And so God is really doing something so beautiful. So God, God wants you well. But it's only the hungry and the humble that can move into what God has. The cynical and those who lack hunger receive nothing. So I want to stir you this morning to be hungry and humble Say, God, I want to receive from you, but through those who you call. There's this powerful verse where Jesus said, and you will no longer see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me. Jesus said, you won't see me unless you say, blessed is he or she or they who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's what we experienced last weekend as a team. They were just like, we see something on your lives and we want it. God did not disappoint. It was amazing. It was amazing. And I believe God wants to just pour out more of that today. We're trusting at the end of this message, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for freedom. We're going to just break things off lives because Jesus is awesome. Amen. Amen. Come on. Okay, so... So there's an outpouring, but I want to quickly just as an intro before we get into the meat of, of this message, I want to give some context. Luke chapter 5, verse 37. And this is, I'm seeing this play out with pastors, church leaders, church members, Christians across the board. This passage that Jesus is speaking of. And he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Ah, now, the, now, now the preaching is getting lacquer. Somebody's like, yes, the wine. Finally, finally, the pastor is now starting to speak some good stuff. No one puts new wine into old wines. What's the new wine? The new wine is that, that outpouring of the Spirit where Jesus is just Jesus in our midst. The new wine is that reviving, that revival that the Lord wants to release. It says no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And the wineskin is a mindset. The wineskin is a mindset. And it continues, it says, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. Spilling the wine 
and ruining the skins. The new wine would burst the wine. In other words, if you have an old mindset, you say, God, we want revival. So revival comes. God pours it out. But you have an old mindset. It's just going to be crazy. It's going to say, no, 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 no. This is a nice. Then, we, then we're going to know no prophecy, no gifts of the Spirit. Because we haven't embraced the new mindset. You can only pour out the new wine in a new wine skin. Verse 38, new wine must be stored in new wineskins. And then verse 39, but no one, come on, say no one. No one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine. Oh, that breaks my heart. When I see that in people, it's like, they still stuck 10 years ago or 20 years ago. God moved over there. That was new wine, but that new wine is now old. God has moved and he's looking for relationship. He's looking for us to follow him, but we're still stuck in the old. And what, it, what happens is the new wine, it doesn't taste so lacquer at first. It doesn't taste, it's like a little bit out of the box. It's a, maybe a little bit too joyful. <laughs> you know, a little bit too much, too, too happy, you know? <laughs> And you're like, oh, I don't know, you know, the old wine skin is like really morbid, you know. That was good. That was, that was really good. We're just always repenting. Always repenting. Everything is so bad, you know. That, that's the old wine skin. We should repent in the new wine skin, but not the whole time, okay. 80% joy, 20% repent, okay. <laughs> not condemnation and guilt and, oh, you're so terrible and, ah, oh, you know, so morbid. And so the new Wine, when, when it's poured out, it, it results in less control in the church, more joy, more freedom, and miracles upon miracles upon miracles as Jesus is in the house. There's life. There's life. That's the new wine. But you cannot embrace the new wine if you're still with the old wineskin. And so we need to move. And I see there's so many. We see it in, 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 in our church family, some embracing the new wine, there's life, old wine. Oh, there's my swar. A swar. You know, everything is so serious. But there's freedom in Christ, the new wine. But you need a shift. So here's a diagram from my book, Increasing Heaven's Flow, the fivefold. We, we've built, this is the, the that's what we're building out the fivefold. Five rivers, five anointings that leads to the fullness of Christ. Today, we focus on the apostolic, the demonstration of the kingdom of God. And if you want the, 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 the full five, you need to make some shifts. Because even there's an old wine skin when you think of the pastoral, and there's a new wine skin when you think of the pastoral. An old wine skin of the prophetic and a new wine skin of the prophetic. There's a shift the old wine skin is just the prophets is just it's the end. It's the end. <laughs> New wine skin is like there's life. In the natural, it looks like our country's going to hell, but Jesus is saying something good about our country in the name of Jesus. <laughs> New wine skin. New wine skin. It doesn't take an expert to see there are problems. Well done. We have corruption. You know, that's not that that's old wine skin. New wine skin is God is releasing life. And it transforms us. So don't fall for that. The old is just fine. No, pursue the new. And so I was a, a pastor from Ermelua contacted me. Never met, not in the chauffeur family. And he just said to me that he, uh, I did a Zoom call with him and his wife in the week. And it was just incredible. Because he, he said to me that he got my book, Increasing Heaven's Flow which speaks about this diagram and the fivefold anointings. He says he's been next to his bed like for the last few years. He's continually reads it. He says he's preached so many messages out of it and it's transformed their lives. So I'm like on the Zoom call and this couple, they are crying. They are weeping as the power and the presence of God falls upon them. They are set free. Their hearts are restored. They experience life and they are hungry for the more. Ah. Oh. It's like they see it. They see it and they say, oh, we want it. So I so want to encourage you. I haven't promoted my book like in years. So I want to encourage you. If you haven't read it, you can get it at the info table. It's just a hundred rand. Come on, where are you going to get a book for a hundred rand? It's a giveaway. But the idea is to renew your thoughts, renew your mind, reposition yourself in these anointings, these rivers. And suddenly when you pray for people, the kingdom of God comes. Okay. 
what I encourage you to do then. So God is moving and He's calling us to create a slipstream for others to step into the fullness of God as well. So don't get stuck in the old, pursue the new. Amen. Okay, so let's get into it. Revelation 1, I'm gonna share with you about, we've been talking about the Christ-centered life and I wanna take another angle on it this morning before we pray for people. It says in uh, Revelation 1 verse 4, I don't think it's on the screen, but it says, grace to you and peace from him, him who is and who was and who is to come. That's Jesus, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. The Christ-centered life is to live in the reality of the eternal God. Not only who he is right now, but in the light of what he has done, in the victory of what Jesus did at the cross, and then in the reality of who he is to us right now. He is the Savior that washes us clean from all our sins. Amen? He is the deliverer that breaks darkness off our souls. He is the one who heals our bodies. He is the healer. He is the provider that that breaks off poverty off our lives and causes His kingdom to flood in. That's who He is. And so over the last year or so, we've been really pursuing freedom for people. And, uh, and it's very exciting at times. So even on Friday night, we had a youth meeting and it was a freedom night with the youth. And so the one young person uh, just manifested a demonic spirit and it was wild. Praise God. And it's happened before. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to know for hours go on with this. And then the Lord said to me, I'm setting her free tonight. So it was this moment which was like a love letter from hell where the demon said, Andre, you are hated among us. I'm like, yes, straight from hell, love letter from hell. I'm on the right track, praise God. And then the Lord set this young person free from a lot of stuff on her life. Amen, come on, let's praise Jesus for them. Come on, Jesus sets Jesus sets free. If God is real, then the demonic is real. And the enemy is is destroying so many lives. And the Lord has said to me, will you set my children free? I'm like, Lord, I am in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Even like Saturday night in uh, Chofar, Wellington, Paul, it was mass deliverance. It was incredible just to see how God came and touched lives and, and remove lids off people's lives. But we need to live in the reality of the eternal God of what He has already done for us at the cross, that victory, and who He is to us right now. Who is He? Who is Jesus to you right now? Because you need to unlock your faith. You need to believe in who He is, and then you can experience that freedom. Jesus paid for a lot of things that very few Christians are actually embracing. And so I want to release that this morning. And so here's this diagram. We've been talking about the circle. In the middle is the Christ-centered life. On the edge is where we live in unbelief. But when you live in fullness of faith, you're gonna be at the center. You're gonna be in that place where miracles break out, in that place where the kingdom comes, in that place where breakthrough happens. On the fringes, unbelief. In the center, faith. In what Jesus did and who He is. So let's move into that place. Okay, so what did Jesus do? What did He pay for? Well, He paid to wash our sins away, to wash us clean. He paid for our freedom. He broke the power of darkness of our lives. He paid for our healing. He was whipped so that you can be healed. And He paid for our provision. He became poor so that we can have more than enough. Poverty is a curse. Jesus broke every curse at the cross. So look at this, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, just on the whole topic of poverty. It says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Generous grace, our God is generous. There's no lack in the kingdom of God. It says, though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. 
Why did he become poor? So that by his poverty, he could make you rich. Okay, now I'm not saying millionaires. I'm saying, and the context is finances. If you read the context, Paul, the apostle is talking about financial provision. And he's saying, Jesus became poor so that you might become rich. What is rich? Rich means more than enough for yourself and for extending the kingdom of God. And for extending the kingdom of God. Do you, enjoy, do you enjoy struggling financially? Is it fun not knowing where provision is coming at the end of this month? Is that empowering? Is that freedom? No, it's not. So many people in the, in the, in the, in the church world, they are bound by a spirit of poverty. So they lack and they are anxious and they are struggling and they cannot focus on the kingdom of God coming. And I believe the Lord wants to break off the spirit of poverty. It's a curse. Come on, say poverty is a curse. It's a curse. Jesus died to break off every curse. I believe when he says rich, not just spiritually rich, rich financially in the way of more than enough for yourself and for doing the will of God, expanding the kingdom of God. Okay? Jesus became poor so that you might have more than enough. Amen. You need to, we need to receive He became poor so that you can be provided for. You see, what's happening for many people is we accept the status quo. Oh, I'm sick of my body. That's just how it is. Maybe it's God teaching me a lesson. Maybe God is the source of this disease so I can keep me humble. Do you know what? Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to change. You say, oh, I'm just struggling financially, just how it always is. This is just the will of God. You know, poor people are humble people and more godly people. That's nonsense in the name of Jesus. If you accept the status quo, it's just fine for you to be anxious the whole time and struggling and, and, and bound by patterns of sin or addiction. If you, if you accept the status quo, you are saying, I believe more in Satan than I believe in what Jesus did for me. And we're going to break that off your life. That's unbelief. You need to say, I'm not going to accept this. No, I'm not going to accept sickness and disease. No, I'm not going to accept poverty in the name of Jesus. No, I'm not going to accept being tormented by the enemy. No, I'm not going to accept being bound by, by evil. The truth is God wants you well. And, 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 and so many people are like, I mean, if I was like, if I was, if Jesus was whooped for us, I mean, he was Beaten, the Bible says, by his stripes, you are healed. If I was whipped for you, I would like, hey, please receive my, what I bought for you. No, 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 I just want salvation. No, but I got whipped for you. I was beaten for your healing. I'd be offended. I'd be offended if I went through all of a hell for your freedom. And you say, no, 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 I just want salvation. Jesus died for more than just salvation, although salvation is obviously, it's incredible, beautiful. The good news is he died for our sins and for our diseases. He did, but we need to receive it. And therefore you need to have something needs to shift on the inside, say, I'm not going to accept this. It's even with me and my, my, my wife, at times she struggled with insomnia and whatever else. And I'm like, this is unacceptable. This is not what Jesus died for. And then you move closer to Christ. God wants you well. He wants to provide for you. Don't accept the negatives in your life. Oh, that's just how it is. And please don't blame God for bringing evil into your life. It is not. Jesus did not go around killing children. or He just raised the dead. He messed up every funeral. He revealed He revealed the glory of God. So James 4 verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. Submit to God. Humble yourselves. Say, God, we come and we surrender ourselves to you. And then it says, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, resist anything that is not of God. Demonic torment, it's not of God. Resist it. Enemy will flee. Sickness is not of God. Resist it. Anything sin, resist it. Anything poverty, resist it. Do, do not accept. Otherwise, you have no faith. And faith connects us to the power of God. So we see this in Revelation 1 verse 5. 
it continues that passage um, and it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Do you see it there? He washed us in his own blood. There is soap available right now in the spirit. The best, most powerful spiritual omo in the universe. The blood of Jesus. Why not receive the blood of the lamb to wash you, cleanse you from all your things from the past and break off every pattern of sin? Jesus paid the price to set you free. So don't accept patterns of sin or addictions or whatever else. Like, no. This isn't what Jesus died for. He died to set me free. And then he says in verse six, and has made us kings and priests to his God and father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's always about Jesus' glory. But he says he made us kings and priests. He made us kings and priests. In other words, you're not only saved, born again as a believer, you are also seated in heavenly places as Ephesians chapter two says. And then why are you seated in heavenly places? So that you can show the riches of his glory to this world. Seated as kings. So it was awesome uh, at the church in Cape Town. On Saturday evening, I was praying for, okay, God, okay, end of worship, we would do ministry, we'd pray for people. And I was just asking God, okay, God, what should we pray for? What are the specific conditions we should call out? And as I was praying, I, I heard backs, I heard hearing, uh, I heard lungs like asthma and uh, one other thing. And as I'm praying, the next moment I hear God say to me, I'll back you. No matter what you call out, you can call out anything. I'm going to heal them. I was like, whoa, that is awesome. That is next level. And, that, and that's what we experienced. So I was praying and I felt some of these conditions. And the next moment, the Holy Spirit said to me, only call out 20 plus year conditions. I'm like, oh, that's uncomfortable. So we called it out. About what? Eight to 10 people came forward. And so the one lady, she'd only had 30% hearing in her one ear. Jesus healed her hearing. She was healed. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. And then another guy, he had like 20 years plus of back problems, an operation a year and a half ago. And, and, you know, he's been struggling with things in his life. And as we prayed, he was healed 50% then 70% then fully healed. And the next day he testified in church that he was healed from this 20 plus year condition. It was from, from school days. He had an injury with rugby or something. And then he says also his nine months Achilles heel problem was also healed. Amen. Come on, give Jesus praise. He heals. And so one by one, as Alan shared, the the shoulder was healed. And so one by one, they were healed of these conditions. You see, because it is the will of God to heal. The problem is not the will of God. Unbelief is. And so the last two people, they had back problems, 20 plus year back problems. And and they weren't, the one lady weren't healed. The one lady, she was really struggling with her back. If you should just move a little bit, she's like, oh, she was like real pain, tears running down her face. And then uh, Tracy came to pray and she just discerned that there's a trauma that she went through underneath this. This is either blocking the healing or the root of the healing. So she broke off the trauma of her life and boom, she was healed. Amen. Jesus heals. Amen. So you see, we, we, we are a three-part being. Sometimes this trauma, emotional, spiritual trauma, and that influences our physical health. Sometimes it's demonic and we need to break that. Sometimes it's just you're sick in your body. There's a disease. And Jesus can heal all of that. Amen. So I, it was just, it just really blew me away when the Lord said, I'll back you. See, that, that's the spirit of sonship. That is like, I'm going to back you. Whatever you call out, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to heal it. And I really believe God's going to heal this morning. So last passage I want to read before we pray for people. Matthew 17. So how do we access all that Jesus paid for and who he is? How do we access it? Well, faith. Faith. So let's look at this. And when they had come to the multitude, 
a man came to him. Jesus came down from the mountain after transfiguration and they came to this multitude. It says that a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, imagine that kneeling down. This is a dad. This is a dad whose heart is breaking for his boy. He says, Lord, have mercy on my son for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. There's a dad crying out. So I brought him to the disciples, but they could not cure him. Ah, why did Jesus answer? Well, you know, in this case, it's not the will of God. Or oh, in this case, you all know, this sickness is just too big. It is just too big for God to heal. No, that wasn't Jesus' response. Look at his response. Jesus is upset that his disciples prayed and there wasn't healing. He's upset. He's like, this is unacceptable. He says, then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless, unbelieving and perverse, corrupt generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Are you seeing it? It's not, as Jesus saying, don't accept it. Don't accept you pray and nothing happened. Don't accept some condition. Don't accept if we, the whole package that Jesus died for. Don't accept poverty or struggling financially. Don't accept demonic torment. Don't accept sickness in your body. Don't accept patterns of sin and addiction. Don't accept it. Pursue faith. But he gives the answer there. He says it's the unbelief. You need to get the unbelief. So how it works is like, imagine you have a, a horse carriage and there are horses of faith pulling the horses, the carriage this way. And on the other side, you have unbelieving horses pulling in the other direction. What are you going to have? You're going to go nowhere. Little faith. Why? Because the unbelieving horses are neutralizing the believing, the faith. That's what he's saying, corrupt generation. Your faith has been corrupted with unbelief, unbelieving doctrines, unbelieving experiences that maybe have wounded your heart, but unbelief have come in. And the Lord is saying, no, this, don't accept it. Don't accept it. I've experienced this a few times in my life. So what happened, I think what happened with the disciples in that case was like they they, I mean, they've seen miracles. They were sent out two by two. They've been praying for people to be delivered and healed. They've seen many miracles. But in this case, their faith was neutralized. Their faith. I, I can imagine as the boy epileptic fits. I mean, that is wild. So they were looking with their physical eyes, their natural eyes, and it freaked them out. Maybe not in this case, God's going to heal. It neutralized their faith. And I've seen this when I was in Ivory Coast once or twice. I would like, man, I'm, I've, I've got faith. I've got faith. It's going to happen. And then as I'm praying for like, say, there's a hundred people that need healing right now. And I'm praying and I'm suddenly, I start to buckle on the inside. I'm allowing my physical sight to influence what I believe God is saying and what God is doing. And so before last weekend in the ministry in Cape Town, I was like, not this time. I'm, I refuse unbelief. In Jesus' name. So I was like, I'm not going to accept. I'm not going to allow my physical sight to influence my faith. I'm going to push through until the will of God happens. So Sunday night, we had a youth meeting. A hundred youth. And at the end of worship, I just felt the Lord say, you know, he's going to heal everyone. Call him forward. I'm going to back you. Again, the Lord said, I'm going to back you. So I call forth those who have pain in their bodies and any other athletic injuries and things. So they come forward, about 10 of the youth and some, some adults as well. And so the one girl, she comes with, she has excruciating pain. She, she comes there with tears running down her face because all the pain that she has in her back. So she's just like, she needs healing. The other girl, she has braces on her knees. Okay, so she has knee problems. She believed it's because of, you know, growing too quickly or whatever. So she has pain in both of her knees. The other girl has a hamstring problem and so forth. And so, so each one has different kinds of challenges. And the one uh, worship leader also responded. He had, uh, I think, knee problems and, and ankle problems. And I was like, okay, God, we're stepping out. The, the youth's faith. 
faith depends upon you showing up, Jesus. So please show up. <laughs> so, so I'm stepping out. And so now we're praying for the girl with the, with the back, major back from tears. She, the power of God comes upon her. She falls to the floor. She gets up fully healed. Praise God. Hallelujah. Then we, eat, like each one, one after the other. So then the, the girl with the braces on her knees, she tests the one knee uh, or, or this kind side and, and, and that's healed. Pray for other side, there's still pain. And, and the worship leader says, no, he has still got pain in his, in his knee and his, and his ankle. And I said, well, that's unacceptable. So I came over to him and I prayed for him. And then I came back to this girl again to pray over here. And then I told him, test again, because the Lord is gonna heal you now. So he tested again his knee and his, and his ankle. And then he said, it's the same. I'm like, what do you mean it's the same? No, 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 it's the same as the good knee, the good knee. Praise God. I'm like, yes, that is a good word. It's the same as the good knee. And then we prayed for this girl with the, with the, with the knees, and, oh, the, the girl with the hamstring. The next moment, God healed her. Her eyes went like, what? And the tears started to run down her face. And then she ran away. I don't know why she ran away. <laughs> but God healed her. And then we prayed for this other girl. And as I was praying, the Lord said to me, she's healed. So I said, you're healed. You have been healed. So we pray. She goes down onto her knee and she comes up and she's like, no, still pain. I'm like, no, you are healed in Jesus' name. So we prayed again. She went down and when she came up, the pain was gone. Her eyes were like, no way. And the tears started to run down her face and she was touched beautifully. Come on, give Jesus praise. What if the will of God is not the problem, but unbelief is? That evening God moved amongst those young people. They will never forget that meeting. The kingdom of God came. They were blown away. We need to give evidence for the reality of our faith. Amen? And for this, we need to connect. We need to, we need to get unbelief out and embrace true, true faith. Verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from the very hour. So in this case, the epileptic fits were, had a demonic root. It doesn't always, is like that. You have to discern, is this just a physical thing? Is it a spiritual thing? In this case, it was a demonic thing. Then verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Unbelief corrupts your faith. And then he gives us wonderful encouragement. He says, for assuredly, I say to you, this is like when Jesus says assuredly, he's like, you're gonna struggle to receive my words now, but this is the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, mustard seed, I don't know how big, how, how big is a mustard seed? It is super tiny. It is like tiny, 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 tiny. Super tiny. So Jesus saying, tiny faith is all you need to move mountains, says there. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So big faith is not the goal. Just get unbelief out. Just get the corruption out. Unbelieving thoughts, unbelieving just, you know, don't, don't focus on what is not happening. Focus on what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done for you. It says nothing will be impossible. So you can speak to the mountain of poverty and lack and you say, get out of my life. Jesus is my provider in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease, get out. Mountain move in the name of Jesus. Jesus is my healer. He was whooped so that I could be healed. Every demonic torment and darkness, get out in the name of Jesus. Because God, Jesus, came to destroy the works of darkness. Amen? So if you want to live the Christ-centered life, you need to live in the reality of the eternal God. What He has done for you and who He is to you right now. Remove the unbelief and receive that breakthrough. The mountains are going to move. So very quickly, just four things. Just want to mention it. Four things in terms of mountain moving faith. Number one, renounce unbelief. I believe there's a spirit of unbelief and you need to renounce it. There are unbelieving theology, unbelieving arguments, renounce it. Then hear the word. The word of the Lord unlocks faith. 
then act upon your faith. You need to do something. You need, there needs to be evidence for your faith. Like step out and pray for somebody or step out and be prayed for. Or if you want financial breakthrough, some, you, know, you have to give. You have to step out and say, I'm going to sow a seed of, of faith. God, you are my provider. That is the evidence of real faith. And then you need to speak to the mountain. You have authority. You need to say, this mountain, whatever it is, get out of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, say mountain move. In Jesus' name. Amen.